I am Kaylee, also known as Rosie's Reptiles on pretty much all social media platforms. I recently redid my leopard gecko care guide, and I figured this would be a good opportunity to make a YouTube video on it. I will put timestamps for everything, um, so if you want to skip through the video, you totally can. I'm perfectly fine with that. But yeah, I I'm going to be going off of my care guide. So if you want to follow along, it's in my link tree. To start with an introduction, uh, leopard geckos, as most of you guys know, uh, or their scientific name is Eublepharis macularis, and they're found in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, and parts of India. These geckos are terrestrial, they are clumsy climbers, but they will climb if they're given the opportunity. Just a quick disclaimer before we get started, I highly recommend looking at multiple different care guides, not just one. Every care guide has a bunch of different things to offer and maybe you'll learn something new. Yeah, look at multiple different care guides, don't rely on one. I will link a whole bunch of care guides and the care guides that I went off of in the caption, um, as well as my own. I've also created a shopping list for a bioactive slash naturalistic leopard gecko setup, um, along with almost everything you need for their care, and I'll link that below as well too. Okay, so starting with size and lifespan of leopard geckos. Leopard geckos uh, can be anywhere from 7 to 10 inches long from head to tail, um, and they can also weigh from 40 to 75 grams. Leopard geckos can live anywhere from 15 to 25 years. This is huge and needs to be taken into consideration before purchasing an animal like this. You need to consider where you're going to be in 15 to 20 years. Um, are you going to college? Are you planning to move somewhere that won't allow animals? Are you planning to travel? These are things you should take into consideration before bringing a leopard gecko home, as they aren't a small commitment. There are multiple different places to get leopard geckos from. I'm gonna list off a few options and then go over each of them in, in a little bit of detail. One of the places you can get leopard geckos from is breeders. There are some pros and cons to going with a breeder. One of the main things is to make sure you're doing your research. Make sure that breeder can provide you with the genetics or at least the morph of the animal. Make sure the breeder knows the hatch date of the animal and can tell you exactly what that animal's been eating. I also prefer to go for breeders that support the use of UVB and overhead heating rather than keeping the animal in a tub or a bin or a rack. <laughs> and I also am more inclined to purchase from breeders who are ensuring their animals are going to proper homes, that the person taking their animal home is has the proper setup and is ready and equipped to take care of this animal. Downside to purchasing from a breeder. The leopard gecko market is extremely oversaturated. If you go into morph market there are thousands of leopard geckos for sale and there are so many that are being rehomed and need better homes and so many that are neglected and abused. So I mean purchasing from a breeder guarantees you a, a, an ethical breeder. Purchasing from an ethical breeder guarantees you a healthy animal. Um, that is the major upside to purchasing from a breeder. Myself personally, my crested gecko and my leopard gecko are both from trusted breeders and my African bat tail is from a local reptile shop. The next place you can get your um, leopard gecko from is reptile expos. Reptile expos are amazing. They're a lot of fun. They're so much fun to network. It's, they're great. However, <laughs> there are some downsides to purchasing animals from reptile expos. Parasites. Parasites are super easily contracted at these expos just because the animals are in such close proximity Not everybody is going to be an ethical breeder and have the clean have a clean breeding facility And this is typically where the parasites come from. They come from Gross improper breeding facilities. One of the pros to purchasing from expos is that the animal is readily available You can see the animal you can hold the animal you can get kind of a sense for their temperament but not really. This is also a con. Reptiles at expos are typically completely different once you bring them home. Like, they're just scared while they're there. They're in containers, they're under bright lights, they just want to sleep, and they're being held by people. They're scared. So their personalities, once you bring them home and once they settle in, are really different. <laughs> Another place you can purchase your leopard gecko from is pet stores. This one's huge. There are chain pet stores and there are local ethical pet stores. Big difference between the two. Do not purchase a leopard gecko from a chain pet store like PetSmart or Petco. These animals are typically labeled as normal leopard gecko or fancy leopard gecko. This is the name given to an animal th with unknown genetics, and this can be extremely dangerous. These leopard geckos sold at big chain pet stores are typically from reptile breeding mills, which are kept in disgusting condition. Um, these animals are typically sick when you purchase them. On the other hand, you could purchase from local reptile shops who purchase from ethical breeders. With that being said, you again need to do your own research as to if that reptile shop is ethical, what their practices are, look at their enclosures, stuff like that. But again, 
do your research on these shops. Lastly, you could also rescue a leopard gecko from Kijiji, Craigslist, sometimes even Facebook Marketplace, or local rescues in your area. There are some pros to doing this. You are literally giving a leopard gecko a second chance at life. However, you need to be prepared for the vet bills that come with rescuing an animal. But if you're prepared for the funds that come with rescuing an animal, go for it. It's an amazing opportunity. You're literally giving an animal a second chance at life and it's beautiful. Onto enclosures, leopard geckos require a minimum of a 40 gallon. A 36 by 18 by 18 is what is recommended as their minimum. That is a 50 gallon, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't go any smaller than that. Some people say to put baby and juvenile leopard geckos in a 20 gallon enclosure. This is honestly, in my opinion, a huge waste of money and waste of time too, because they grow so quickly, you're going to end up upgrading to a 40 gallon in maybe six months less than that actually. You could even go as big as a 4x2x2 four by two by two for a leopard gecko, but clutter is key when it comes to this. I would much rather see a beautifully cluttered 36 by 18 by 18 than a bare, like too much open space 4x2x2. Two by two by two. But if you can clutter the crap out of a 4x2x2 four by two by two and manage to heat it properly for a leopard gecko, do it. I f you have my full support. Leopard geckos also need a minimum of three hides, a warm hide, a humid hide, and a moist hide. I recommend going way above this. Three hides makes a 50 gallon enclosure look very bare. Put way more hides in this. You could use stuff like cork. Um, you could use cork rounds, cork flats, uh, a bunch of slate. Pretty much try to make it as natural as possible. If your leopard gecko wouldn't have a couch in the wild, why would you put a couch in their enclosure in captivity? Leopard geckos also need a ton of climbing opportunity. They are clumsy climbers, but they will climb if given the opportunity. Uh, you can use branches to do this. A little more detail on the humid hide. Um, you can actually make humid hide on a budget out of an old Tupperware container, just cut a hole in the side and you put a uh, moist paper towel or sphagnum moss inside the container. But if you're wanting a humid hide that looks more naturalistic, I have the ones I personally use linked in my Amazon storefront. With enclosure for leopard geckos comes the topic of cohabitation. If you're watching this video, you should not be cohabiting leopard geckos. Cohabitation of leopard geckos is when you house two or more leopard geckos in an enclosure together. This can only be properly done by zookeepers. I am yet to actually see a properly cohab leopard gecko enclosure. I do acknowledge that leopard geckos are loose colony social in the wild. However, in the wild, there is unlimited space for them to escape each other. In captivity, there is not. So again, this is extremely dangerous and I do not, do not in any way, shape or form suggest cohabbing leopard geckos. I will insert some inspiration for a few enclosures. As mentioned, it is best to try to keep the enclosure looking as natural as possible. Mimic, try to mimic their natural environment. Again, if they wouldn't have a couch in the wild, why would you put a couch in their enclosure in captivity, right? A big topic around bringing a new leopard gecko home is quarantining. Quarantining a new reptile is the 60 to 90 day period where that animal is on paper towel substrate and is their poop is being monitored. Uh, this is the time when you take them to see a vet and you have a fecal test done. All new reptiles should be quarantined for 60 to 90 days away from other reptiles to decrease the risk of spreading parasites. A reptile can be tested for parasites uh, through a fecal test. You want to ensure that you have a clear fecal test before putting that animal onto loose substrate as the parasites will breed and multiply within the dirt. Next, we're moving on to heating and humidity for leopard geckos. Leopard geckos require an overhead heat source. Now, leopard geckos do need belly heat, but I will tell you exactly how to provide that using overhead heat. The reason we recommend overhead heat for leopard geckos is because it stimulates a more natural environment. If you think about it, the sun is above them, that's what heats up the rocks below them, and that's what they bask on to get that belly heat. I personally recommend the Arcadia halogen bulbs. Uh, what wattage you use depends on your distance away from your basking spot. And if you need a nighttime heat source, I highly recommend the Arcadia deep heat projector. To go into more detail about the wattage, um, you want to make sure that the bulb that you're using is being used to its fullest potential. The reason we recommend halogen bulbs and deep heat projectors is because they give off IRA and IRB. These two light spectrums penetrate super deep into the um, reptile's tissue rather than IRC, which is given off by ceramic heat emitters and heat mats, which only heat the surface layer of their skin. Long story short, allowing the heat to penetrate super deep into your leopard gecko aids with digestion. So again, what wattage should you use? This is, again, dependent on the distance away from your basking spot. To try to put this in simplest terms, you don't want to be dimming the bulb like crazy because that will be diminishing the, the amount of IRA and B that's given off. You want to be using that bulb to its max potential. With that being said, all heat sources, regardless of 
regardless of what they are, heat mat, ceramic heat emitter, halogen, deep heat projector need to be on thermostats. Which thermostat you choose depends on the type of heat source you're using. On-off thermostats tend to be cheaper than dimming slash pulse thermostats, but you would not use an on-off thermostat for a halogen that gives off light because that light will be flickering on and off constantly. For halogen, you wanna be using a dimming thermostat. This one will pretty much just dim the light when it gets too hot and brighten it up when it gets too cold. You could use an on-off thermostat for a deep heat projector that doesn't give off any light because it doesn't matter if you turn that on and off, you're not gonna see it. For reference, or just as an example, I personally use the 75 watt Arcadia halogens on a dimming thermostat set to the max. I have it set to the max so that it's not dimming constantly. I did test out the 100 watt Arcadia halogen and it was constantly dim dimming, diminishing the amount of IRA and B that was given off. Your thermostat acts as a fail safe and in fire prevention. You must have all your heat sources attached to a thermostat. Now on to numbers. The basking spot for a leopard gecko enclosure should be between 90 and 92 degrees Fahrenheit. The warm side should be between 82 and 86 degrees Fahrenheit, and then the cool side, which is the opposite end of where your heat and UVB are, should be around 75 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Ensuring that you're, you are achieving this uh, proper temperature gradient allows for thermoregulation. Thermoregulation is basically how reptiles regulate their body temperature as they are cold-blooded. Humidity is a super quick one to address. Leopard geckos require humidity between 30 and 40%. This is pretty achievable for the average household. If you find that your humidity is dropping too low, like into the 20s, um, you could try adding, you, you could even lightly mist the enclosure. Um, substrates even help with that. If you're using too drying of a substrate, try adding something that holds a little bit more moisture. Like I mentioned before, leopard geckos need a humid hide and this humid hide has a humidity of about 80%. This is to ensure that they can properly shed. Be careful with raising the humidity in your enclosure as if the humidity is raised too high for too long, it can cause a respiratory infection. On to lighting. Leopard geckos require linear UVB lighting. UVB lighting gives off vitamin D3, which is essential for the absorption and utilization of calcium. UVB is also incredibly beneficial for the leopard gecko's overall health. UVB, along with proper supplementation, which I'll talk about a little bit later, help to prevent metabolic bone disease. Metabolic bone disease is pretty much a condition where their bones become mush and they become really deformed and then their health just rapidly declines. For UVB, I highly recommend the Arcadia 7% Shade Dweller. This is the perfect UVB for them. Um, this was literally made for leopard geckos. As for placement of your heat and your UVB, you want your heat and UVB to be on the same side of the enclosure. Um, you don't want your heat on one side and then your UVB on the other side. That defeats the purpose. They're going to bask in one area. They're going to bask under that heat and at the same time they should be getting access to the UVB. And this goes for all reptiles. This is not just leopard geckos. All heat and UVB should be on the same side of the enclosure. You can add additional lights to their enclosure. Um, say for example you have a live planted enclosure. Uh, you're going to want LEDs. LEDs ensure proper plant growth. This is again completely optional but it's great to have. And I recommend the Arcadia Jungle Dawn. Next, substrates. There are a ton of reptile substrates out on the market. Um, a lot of them are unsafe though. We'll start with the unsafe substrates. Using just sand, not safe. Mixing sand with other substrates can be safe, but using sand by itself is not a good idea. I'm gonna put everything right here, but sand. Sand by itself is not a good loose substrate for leopard geckos. Next, Vitasan and calcium sand. These are incredibly unsafe loose substrates and pose a huge impaction risk. Eco Earth, coconut chips, and Repti Bark are not safe loose substrates or proper loose substrates for leopard geckos either. Reason being is that uh, any coconut fiber type substrate, when dry, are so dusty that they can cause respiratory infections. They're great for high humidity species like crested geckos, certain snakes, stuff like that but not for leopard geckos. Aspen and walnut shells are also not appropriate loose substrates for leopard geckos. Um, aspen, when uh, it gets moist, ends up molding super quickly, and it's, again, not a natural substrate for them at all. Walnut shells, huge impaction risk. Um, these should not be used for, none of these should be used for any reptile. And last but not least, really popular substrate amongst reptile keepers is reptile carpet and sand mats. These two substrates are super unsafe. They are almost impossible to clean and harbor a crap load of bacteria. Reptile carpet itself is also known for ripping out nails and teeth when they get caught. Okay, so next we'll talk about some safe loose substrates for leopard geckos and what types of mixtures you can do. Starting with reptosoil. Reptosoil is an incredibly safe loose substrate. I will say though, I do recommend mixing it with play sand um, because it does hold humidity really, really, really well. 
Arcadia Earth Mix Arid is another super good substrate. I personally found this one incredibly dry, so I mixed it with Reptosoil and it was golden. Biodu Terra Sahara is another really good loose substrate for leopard geckos. And now there's a few mixtures that you can do. Organic Topsoil is a great option. There are certain brands that are recommended over others. You want to make sure there's, they're not made of manure, there's no perlite, um, that it is organic topsoil. But my favorite mixture and the one that I'm personally using for my leopard gecko is a mix of 60% Reptosoil or organic topsoil, 20% play sand, and 20% um, exoterra desert stone. Yeah, the red one. <laughs> Another mixture you can do that's super affordable and that you can literally get at your hardware store is a mix of 70% organic topsoil and 30% play sand. This is what a lot of keepers recommend. All these safe, loose substrates for leopard geckos are bioactive ready. So if you wanted to go bioactive, which we'll talk about in a little bit, you can totally do. There are some exceptions as to when you shouldn't use loose substrate. First, you shouldn't use loose substrate if your leopard gecko is in quarantine. You also shouldn't use loose substrate if your leopard gecko is under the age of six months old. I personally moved my leopard gecko onto loose substrate at about seven months after she was cleared by a vet and had a clean fecal test. Again, disabled or sick reptiles should not be housed on loose substrate. These guys should definitely be on paper towel. There is the argument that uh, loose substrate can cause impaction. This has been proven false. It's actually improper husbandry and improper loose substrates that are the cause of impaction. By husbandry, I mean your heating, lighting, humidity, all that type of jazz. If that is all on point, there is no reason your leopard gecko cannot ingest a little bit of substrate and be perfectly fine. Loose substrate is incredibly beneficial for them. It provides them with mental stimulation, promotes their natural behaviors, and it contributes to their overall health and well-being. We'll briefly talk about going bioactive. A bioactive enclosure is a setup that includes living elements that basically create a mini ecosystem. It includes live plants, fungi, and microfauna. So you're gonna need a safe loose substrate to do this. You're also gonna need a cleanup crew. For leopard geckos, I do recommend springtails, dairy cow or powder orange isopods are my favorite, but do your research, you might find that a different one works better for you. I also, this is optional, but I really recommend adding mealworm beetles to your bioactive enclosure. They just tend to do better in the arid environment than the isopods. I find the isopods collect underneath the water dish or in the humid hide, and they don't really do what they're supposed to do. But the mealworm beetles can survive in almost anything, and they are a really good cleanup crew. A few live plant options are like a Haworthia, I think that's how you say it, snake plant, aloe, you could use some thornless cactus pads, Echeveria, if that's how you say that. Even jade plants are great to put in bioactive leopard gecko enclosures. Next, nutrition for leopard geckos. Leopard geckos can have, they need a variety. Variety is key in order to maintain the health of the animal. Giving your leopard gecko one insect is pretty much equivalent to feeding yourself mac and cheese for your entire life. <laughs> Some staples are dubia roaches, if you have access to them, mealworms, silkworms, black soldier fly larvae, discoid roaches, and even crickets. Some treats, on the other hand, superworms, hornworms, uh, waxworms, butterworms. That's my list, but I'm pretty sure there's a few more that are treats. Remember, to gut load your insects at least 24 hours in advance before feeding your reptile. Gut loading ensures that, that your animal is getting the best nutrition possible and that your insects are not just empty carcasses. Important disclaimer, please do not feed freeze-dried insects to your leopard gecko. They need live bugs. I'll quickly touch upon a feeding schedule for your leopard gecko. This is, kind of take this with a grain of salt, this is just kind of a, personally what I've experienced works. For baby leopard geckos between zero and six months, it's recommended to feed them every single day. Some people say to feed them how much they'll eat in five minutes. I recommend between eight and 12 bugs because sometimes they can be insatiable monsters. Uh, watch what size of bug you're feeding. You don't want to feed a bug that's bigger than the space between their eyes. For juvenile leopard geckos between six months and one year, you should start feeding them every second day. Again, same rule of thumb eight to 12 bugs, no bigger than the space between their eyes. For adult leopard geckos that are older than one year, you should feed them every three to five days. Now this totally depends on the leopard geckos. Like humans, they have different metabolisms. So if your leopard gecko has a fast metabolism and is on the skinnier side, feed them more often. But if your leopard gecko is on the chonkier side, feed them every five days. My biggest piece of advice is that you know your leopard gecko best. Trust yourself, you know when to feed them. Leopard geckos should always have access to clean drinking water. If you use tap water, you can get, there's a there's a product called uh, Reptisafe. Yeah, Reptisafe, I'll put a picture. And it basically is a water conditioner that can be used to make your tap water drinkable for reptiles. Leopard geckos require three different types of supplements, calcium with D3, calcium without D3, and a multivitamin. Each supplement serves its own purpose and they're all essential for the health and well-being of your animal. Starting with calcium, calcium is 
mandatory for their growth. Like they need it for their bones, they, they need calcium. Calcium absorption is linked to the synthesis of vitamin D3. Vitamin D3 is produced from uh, UVB lighting but can also be supplemented with the supplement calcium with D3. This supplement should not be accessible at at all times for that leopard gecko. I personally only supplement calcium with D3 twice a month. Calcium without D3, on the other hand, can be provided at all times for this animal. Leopard geckos can actually sense when they are low on calcium and will go seeking a calcium source. A lot of people recommend putting a little bottle, bottle cap size of uh, calcium without D3 in their enclosure at all times. This is also why VitaSand and Calcium Sand are incredibly unsafe because if that leopard gecko is low on calcium, they will start to eat that sand. And become impacted. I recommend supplementing calcium without D3 every feeding. Lastly, a multivitamin is a broad spectrum supplement that provides them with the minerals and nutrients that they do not receive from their food regularly. This supplement plays a huge role in their immune function and overall well-being. I recommend supplementing this multivitamin twice a month around the same time that you supplement the calcium with D3. We'll move on to handling and temperament of leopard geckos. Personally, I have found leopard gecko babies to be incredibly skittish and jumpy. <laughs> However, with handling and age, they tend to settle down quite a bit. To bond with your leopard gecko, I highly recommend hand feeding. This can be with your fingers or it can be with tongs. For tongs, I recommend rubber tip tongs, um, just because if they bite down on the rubber, they're not gonna hurt themselves. If they bite down on the metal, they're gonna hurt themselves. Non-forceful handling is also a really good way to gain your reptile's trust. Weird one, to bond with your leopard gecko would be talking to them. They do start to recognize your voice. Spend tons of time around their enclosure and they'll start to get more comfortable coming out. I would also like to touch upon leopard gecko's ability to drop their tails, and this is known as autotonomy. Basically, it's just a defense mechanism. In the wild, if a leopard gecko is threatened or their tail is grabbed onto by a predator, they will drop their tail to escape. The purpose of their tail is to store extra leftover energy. This is probably why you can see if they lose their tail, it's not really ideal. Their tail will grow back, it does take time. However, you should never, ever, ever be attempting to make your gecko drop its tail just something they can do, kind of cool. But yeah, don't stress your gecko out to the point where it drops its tail. Lastly, we'll talk about a leopard gecko's health. Having access to a educated exotic vet is incredibly important when keeping any reptile. Just like you would take your dog or your cat to the vet once a year for a checkup, you take your leopard gecko as well. There are a few sicknesses I'd like to go over that leopard geckos can get, um, but these need to be dealt with by a vet. Like I mentioned before, metabolic bone disease is due to a calcium and vitamin D3 deficiency. Proper husbandry is what prevents metabolic bone disease. Upper respiratory infections are caused by um, improper temperatures and humidities for leopard geckos, and even poor sanitation. Internal parasites can also be a huge factor and sickness that leopard geckos can get from either where they came from or their food. Parasites basically attack their gastrointestinal tract and deprive them of the nutrients they would get from their food. Male leopard geckos can get uh, what's called a prolapse hemipene, basically when the male reproductive organs get stuck outside of the body and they can't retract in. This again needs to be dealt with by a vet. Another sickness they can get is hypovitaminosis A, which is also known as crypto, which is a parasite infection. This is again another gastrointestinal uh, parasite that deprives the animal of nutrients. It, it's also called stick tail disease as well. This needs to be treated by a vet. Another common sickness for leopard geckos with improper husbandry is impaction, as mentioned before. Impaction is just basically a gastrointestinal blockage. If not addressed, this blockage can lead to serious health issues. And lastly, female leopard geckos can experience something called egg binding. This can be very serious and life-threatening, and it's pretty much when the female leopard gecko has troubles laying their eggs. And yes, female leopard geckos will lay infertile eggs. So that is something to be aware of with female anything. <laughs> I think I touched upon pretty much everything. Um, if you have any other questions, please leave a comment down below. I also, my DMs on Instagram are open if you want to send me pictures of your leopard geckos. I really appreciate it. It's just Rosie's Reptiles. And for those of you watching this video who are getting you a, a leopard gecko for the first time, good luck. You'll love them so much. They're amazing. And yeah, I hope to see you guys in the next one.